we know the history of voting, uh, particularly for people of African American descent, what a long way we've come. We've come a long way, and as a matter of fact, my book, Race, Law, and American Society, 1607 to Present, has a voting rights chapter. Mm -hmm. And so I do a lecture, part of a series called The Obama Factor, 200 Years of Voting Rights, Race, and Law. Mm -hmm. And what I do is follow the different laws that were in place, the obstacles as well as the opportunities that we took as black people to put us in this position today. It's like a river flowing, mm -hmm. a continuum. We didn't start a generation ago or two generations ago. We started hundreds of years ago to get to this point. Would you share with some of our viewers possibly what is it that we might be overlooking? Because while we look at the historic, uh, the historicity of last week, we do know that we've come a long way uh, you know, over a water that's been <laughs> blood, sweat, and tears. Yes, yes, yes. Well, think about this. The Civil War was in 1865. That's when it ended. Mm -hmm. That was the year the 13th Amendment was ratified. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery except as punishment for a crime. And what I like people to do is to go back to the 13th Amendment. You put in the search engines you have. Amazon, Google, whatever it is, put in 13th Amendment and read it for yourself. And you'll see that it was abolished except as punishment for a crime. That's when you started these obstacles, legal obstacles then, for free blacks about voting. The character then became very important. They started to arrest blacks based on all types of different laws they would make up specifically for us. And then at the same time say, well, you can't vote because your character is bad because you have a conviction. So these disenfranchised people we have now, that's a culmination of centuries now of this effect of the criminal justice system on black people. But at the same time that was happening, you also had our first black U.S. senator in 1870, Hiram Rebels from Mississippi. Wow history there. We want to tell you that Gloria, Gloria J. Brown Marshall is the author of Race, Law, and American Society, as you said. Uh, she's also uh, litigated some constitutional law at uh, John Jay College of uh, Criminal Justice, actually. She litigated civil rights and public law cases for the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. So a big history there in knowing from whence we came. Yes, it's very important for us to understand. I believe in Sankofa. Sankofa means basically, as the African saying goes, you have to know your past to understand your present and plan for the future. So if we just think this happened, like Barack Obama's victory fell out of the sky, then we're missing so much. Our ancestors sacrificed so much. There was a time when a person who ran for office had to put their photograph on the ballot. That way people would know if they were voting for someone white or someone black. We had to litigate that all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court and then come all the way back. And even go back to the 1865 year we were talking about before, when Lincoln was assassinated. Remember, Lincoln was a Republican. The South was filled with Republicans until the slaves were freed. Then they switched to Democrats. So for almost 70 years, you had all Democrats in the South, Dixiecrats, what they were called. And they were Dixiecrats because they were, wanted to rebel against the idea that a Republican had freed the slaves. So when you see a lot of lawsuits that went to the U.S. Supreme Court in the South during that time period, it was against the Democratic Party because the Democrats were the conservatives back then. And you look at the Democratic Party now, especially in the, in the, with the election of Barack Obama, his ability to capture so many of those states that were quote unquote traditionally red. And I know from his perspective, he doesn't consider them red states or blue states. He just considers them all states. But call it what it was. I mean, back in the day, I mean, states were traditionally Republican, traditionally white. And the Obama factor allows him to tap into places that normally w other people wouldn't tap into. How, did he, how was he able to make this difference? He was able to make the difference between, because historically, once again, those Democrats, little by little, switched back to the Republican Party. So now we have the Democratic Party we know about. But Fannie Lou Hamer, people should know the name Fannie Lou Hamer. Fannie Lou Hamer was someone who was registered to vote in the 1960s. She didn't even know in Mississippi at that time that blacks had the right to vote. So what we had was a mixture from the North and the South coming together to help voter registration. That's what we have today. We started in the 1960s. Voters from the North as well as the South came together to build a coalition. Without that coalition from the North and the South, Obama would not have been successful. Talk to me about the 60s. Key time, we know Martin Luther King, uh, the Kennedy years. Uh, a pivotal time for uh, the life of America. How did that shape what we saw last week? Well, there were three, of course, slain voter registration students who were in the South, in Mississippi. It was because of that and the Voters' Rights Act 
We had to have the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Now, we had people murdered, those three civil rights workers, as I said before. We had um, a, a number of different people, Fannie Lou Hamer going before the television, letting people know what was going on in the South. Those things had to take place. The 1964 Civil Rights Act, you had to have the March on Washington before that. You had to have the, the Voting Rights Act. You had to have all these things happen. Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, they played a major role. But even a century before that, you had people fighting for voter registration, fighting for the vote to count, the grandfather clauses, those things. Here's something else that people rarely know, that we had to amend the Constitution to get rid of poll taxes. Until 1964, this country still made people pay taxes before they could vote. And so you had to amend the Constitution in order then to have people actually freely, if you can call it freely, mm -hmm. exercise their right to vote. The Klan became official in 1871. That's their official start. They were unofficially terrorizing people before that. Mm -hmm. But in 1871 is when they became officially an organization. So people didn't have to join the Klan to terrorize people, but just think of all those folk, people who voted. 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson. That's a separate but equal case of U U.S. Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Look at it this way. Remember we had a first black senator in 1870. By 1896, which is the year of the Plessy decision, there are over 100,000 black men voting because then only men could vote. Four years later, there are less than 5,000. That's how much terrorism played a role in preventing people from voting. So, so going from 100,000 down to, to 5,000. 5, because of terrorism alone in the fact that the law enforcement was not enforcing laws to protect black people. So when you get to the 1960s and 70s, people put their lives and livelihoods on the line to vote. And we had to capture that again. That's what Barack Obama did. He actually captured that feeling that you too can participate in this country without the fear of your life or livelihood being taken. When you look at the numbers, uh, Barack Obama coming up with millions, somewhere close to eight, uh, a little bit more, over eight million people voting for him. Uh, when you look at that number and you look at the fact of, just as we said before, you're down to 5,000 years ago, what goes through your mind? Well, I go back to the first election of, of George Bush. And I'm not going to bash George Bush. I think there are a lot of people more qualified <laughs> than I am. But I will say, after that first election and the devastating loss before the U.S. Supreme Court in the Bush versus Gore decision, you saw a drop in the people who voted, didn't we? Absolutely. Because they lost faith in the system. Mm -hmm. And one thing that Barack Obama did was to provide that faith again, not because he's some messiah, uh, martyr type character, but he put it in a realistic format that you can participate in the system again. And someone brought to my attention a word that he uses all the time, and that's we. Mm -hmm. That we can do this. Right. And so once people began to feel they were part of a we again, that's when they said, I'm going to take a chance. Because voting is an act of free will. Voting is an act of free will that had been denied black people, immigrants, and other people of color for centuries. And so that to have this act, this investment in the country, you have to first get the person's spirit, and then the action follows. Let's talk about the book. Dr. Gloria J. Brown Marshall is the author of this book. It's called Race, Law, and the American Society. Uh, with pe if, uh, I've got to say voters pick up your book. If people pick up your <laughs> book, what are we going to find on the inside? Well, what I did, I, did, I have to like, you know, have a little commercial for myself. Take it. This is the only book, the only book, that has the, the variety of diverse topics between these two covers. Not only do I look at race and law from the education standpoint, from the colonial period to present, I go all the way back to the fact that blacks couldn't vote who were enslaved Africans, up to busing, to where we are now with white flight. I talk about race in the military. There is no book that has education in it as well as the military and race, all the way from the very beginning up to the Iraq war. I also look at property rights and property ownership. I look at civil liberties, protests, protests during the slave uprisings as well as protests to today. You know, I look at also the longest chapter, which is criminal justice. And criminal justice, I think, is, is, is the longest chapter because that has been the most haunting issue for us. Mm -hmm. It's been the way people in the society has, has really restrained us and prevented us from exercising our free will. And the last chapter is, and of course the chapter on voting rights, but the last chapter is on internationalism and race. Because during the time of slavery, President Douglass was known as internationally as a speaker. He was traveling around the world to get world attention to our, our plight and predicament as enslaved Africans. And we used the International Forum again during the time of lynching to let the world know what was going on.